Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, a member of the club's Board of Governors, chair of the Zetima Project, and your moderator for today. This is another program in the club's virtual series on the coronavirus and COVID-19. You can look at our website at commonwealthclub.org for more information on this series and in a whole variety of other topics. These presentations are free, by the way, and we are very appreciative of the generous support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, as well as a collaborative of local donors. We encourage you to follow their example. You can go to our homepage and make a donation to support this series and the nonprofit Commonwealth Club, which we proudly say is the oldest and largest public affairs forum in America. I want to mention that today is May 20th, 2020. I'm sorry, the 21st. Uh, no, it's the 20th. That's good. And it's important to get that date right for those listening later via podcast or radio because things are moving quickly. And if you listen to this even a few days from now, who knows what the situation will be. I hosted my last program for this series one week ago, May 13th. There were 1.4 million cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. at that point. And as of this morning, we are at 1.6 million. That's about a 15% increase in a week represents a slowing of the rate of new cases, but the number continues to grow. Uh, we won't know for a few weeks about the impact of the various reopenings of states and localities. So right now there's room for both optimism and concern. And to talk about this issue, we have terrific featured guests. I'll introduce them right now. Lani Chen is the David and Diane Steffi Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where he teaches in public policy and also in the law school. He's currently the Senior Advisor on Policy to the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and he's advised four different presidential campaigns, serving as the Policy Director for Mitt Romney in 2012. He's also a member of the Social Security Advisory Board and Chair of the Board of Directors of El Camino Hospital. Farzad Mostashari is a physician. He's an epidemiologist and an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder and CEO of Alidaid, which helps primary care doctors transform their practices into accountable care organizations, working with more than 300 practices around the country that serve more than 650,000 patients. Farzad served in the Obama administration from 2011 to 2013 as the national coordinator for health information technology. So our two guests come from different sides of the political aisle, but they both have reputations for bipartisan work, including activities recently related to reopening the economy. So Lan He recently co-authored a plan to restart the economy with, among others, Bob Kosher, a physician who worked in the Obama White House. And Farzad similarly co-authored a report outlining a national COVID-19 surveillance strategy for the American Enterprise Institute with two former Republican appointed FDA chiefs, Scott Gottlieb and Mark McClellan. I can say that I've known both of our speakers through the Zetima Project, which itself hosts ongoing bipartisan healthcare dialogues. And I can tell you that we're in for a well-informed discussion that will involve plenty of intelligent disagreement. So let's get right to it with the uh, quick exception of, I wanna mention to the audience viewing on YouTube that you are invited to submit questions for our panelists. You can do so by putting them in the chat box, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible during this program. So jumping right in, uh, we're going to start with the assumption that we're not going to have a vaccine for COVID-19 for some time, however long that is, too long to stay fully locked down. And as we know, nearly all states are in the process of reopening their economies. I believe I just heard this morning, Connecticut was the 50th state to reopen, and that's all the states we have. So they're reopening, but at widely varying speeds. So far as I'll start with you, you're an epidemiologist. Uh, you've been looking at this carefully. What criteria should these states and localities be following for reopening? I think fundamentally all of the uh, different plans uh, that have come out from the, the White House, the CDC, others from, uh, for example, Tom Frieden, a former uh, CDC director, they all have the same fundamental structure, which is before we reopen, we should make sure that we know that there are not lots of infected people spreading the virus in the community. That's the first. Uh, so our case is down and declining. Uh, and we have to also have some confidence that should cases flare up, we would know about it and that the hospitals would be able to handle the surge. So those tend to be the common thresholds or criteria or gating 
uh, criteria, as the White House calls it, for moving from one phase to the other. And I think the other feature of all of the kind of epidemiologically informed plans here is that this is not a light switch where you go from closed to open. It's more of a dimmer switch. And how much we can turn that dimmer depends a lot on what else can we bring to bear on control of the outbreak. If we're loosening some of the physical restrictions and we're going to have more contacts, um, then what are we replacing it with? And contact tracing seems to be really the the best hope that we can layer on top of this. And there's been lots of resources uh, and, and lots of attention now paid to turning on uh, contact tracing as a way to suppress the reproductive number even as we reopen. Great. Thank you. We'll talk some more about contract tracing for a while, but first I want to hear from Lon. He, you co-authored a plan with the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity uh, to reopen the economy. And uh, that arguably is somewhat more aggressive than many others in terms of being more rapid. Uh, tell us about the plan and the kind of the philosophy, the theory behind it. Well, I, I think the philosophy and the theory behind it is consistent with uh, with what was just outlined in terms of needing to take a a careful stepwise approach to reopening the economy. Uh, I, I would say one area where my co-authors and I are um, are perhaps a little bit more aggressive is in thinking about how we get our K through 12 uh, educational system back online um, sooner rather than later. And I think that the reason we we feel so strongly about that is uh, is a few things. First of all, there is certainly, with respect to the observed data so far on COVID-19, evidence to suggest that school-aged children are considerably less likely to suffer adverse effects uh, from the virus. And so we, we believe that that is a piece of very good news we should all take to heart. But more importantly, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the economy to reopen in any substantial way until the schools are back online first. Um, the schools being shut to in-person instruction has also raised some very worrying trends around inequities in the educational system, the inability, for example, of students who come from backgrounds and households that don't have access to technology, their ability to remain on pace and on schedule in terms of their own academic progress, that's been a big worry and a big concern, but also the degree to which uh, some of the social interactions and academic progress that come for the student body at large in many schools has been hampered by a move to all distance learning. So uh, we argue that uh, that in many situations, schools should consider reopening this fall with the caveat that not all students will be able to return to school at the same time. In all likelihood, school is not going to look the way it looked even just a few months ago. And more importantly, for some students and faculty who either have uh, comorbidities or conditions that may result in serious adverse health effects from COVID-19, uh, we need to probably figure out a way to continue distance learning or continue um, uh, non sort of in-person interactions. Uh, so we, we're going to have to combine distance learning with in-person instruction. But to, to simply conclude, as some institutions have concluded, that in-person instruction is off the table for the fall what we believe to be a critical mistake, not only for educational reasons, but also for economic ones. Um, let me also say that one thing that my co-authors and I, I think, all agree on is the degree to which this crisis needs to be handled um, very effectively and very efficiently when we're thinking about what's happening in nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities and facilities that serve older populations who are at significant risk from coronavirus, from the novel coronavirus, and needing to, to look carefully at policy interventions to protect those vulnerable populations is going to be really significant as we move forward uh, in, in thinking about how to reopen the economy and deal with, uh, with this virus going forward. Right. So you talked about both the, uh, the schools, the elementary schools, and I know anybody who's got elementary school or high school kids, especially elementary school kids home right now, can't wait for those schools to reopen for a whole variety of reasons. And we talked about the people in the vulnerable, the most vulnerable end. What about all those people in the middle who might or might not go back to work at a whole variety of jobs? What does your plan say about them? Well, first of all, you know, there there's reason to be hopeful, again, in looking at the data with respect to age. There is a strong correlation between 
uh, certainly mortality uh, and age when we think about COVID-19. So we actually uh, suggest that workplaces should think about how they might bring people of younger working age. So let's say in that 25 to 40 year old population, certainly maybe extending all the way up to 50, think about how you might tier a return to work or stepwise return to work that would focus on those working age populations who are less vulnerable uh, in general, as a general matter. Again, you know, th there are always specific cases and situations where we find that even people in those age categories are at significant risk for adverse outcomes and potentially death from COVID-19. COVID-19 is a deadly virus. I don't think anybody should be trying to, to sugarcoat that. But certainly for some populations, it is the case, we believe, that a return to work is entirely appropriate. And th the other piece that we really take on is that employers are probably going to have to step up and take a bigger role in terms of determining the health of their workforces uh, it's going to require expanded testing capacity because we believe that testing eventually is going to have to make its way into the workplace, um, not just temperature screening, but actual testing. And eventually, hopefully, if we have uh, more accurate antibody testing, we're able to deploy that as well to determine if protective antibodies are present in a broader uh, range of the population than what the uh, epidemiological research so far has indicated. So we are of the belief that there is an opportunity here, again, to consider a, a staged return to work uh, in, in a way that relies on the best data we have and the best evidence we have regarding who will suffer from adverse consequences from, from this virus. Great. So Farza, what do you like about what Lonnie's saying and what are you less comfortable with? Well, I like his co-authors, including <laughs> my, my board chair, Bob Kocher. So I gotta be really careful here. And uh, Ovik Roy, who's a, who's a, a friend and a uh, longtime uh, colleague, I think what what I like about the plan is just the attention to detail on the tactics of how do we take every piece of society and, and not just have the open or shut, but think about how we can do harm reduction, as it were, in each of those settings, in schools, in businesses, um, in nursing homes, and, and so forth. Um, the, and workplaces, I think, haven't gotten enough attention the part that I, I guess, honestly, I'm I'm a little puzzled by is I'm not quite sure what the theory of the case is for um, for the plan. Um, whether the assumption here is that if we can protect the elderly, that our assumption is in the the pessimism around you know we don't know how long it'll take to have a vaccine widely available. What is the percent infection that under this plan we would be accepting? in the younger populations. Is the strategy here from an epidemiologic point of view, as some have suggested in Sweden say, is the strategy actually to allow in a controlled way infection to spread among the younger population such that herd immunity develops? Or is the strategy that no, we hope that with these interventions, we're actually gonna keep the infection rate low and only have a very small percent of the total population infected? I guess I'm, I'm not entirely clear on um, on on what what the strategy is, Lanhi. Oh, did you want to respond to that directly? Yeah, no, I think and I, and I think it's a fair question. So first of all, the plan does talk about the the in an advantageous world we would have more testing. We would also have contact tracing, which is something that that I know you've mentioned, which I think is uh, significantly important. Certainly for us to determine what's happening if there are hot spots, we want to be able to identify those. But but I think that there is a relaxation of some of the assumptions around, um, you know, for example, would it make sense for there to be a higher percentage of people uh, in that uh, in the younger categories exposed to the virus? What would be the impact of that? And I think what we are saying is let's take a look at a critical look at the data. And what the data actually tells us is thus far, given infection rates and given what we're seeing in that population, there is a lower risk, not no risk but there is a lower risk of adverse outcomes from that particular age category than there is for the older populations where we do have to be very, very careful about reintroducing people into society. So I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a realistic approach at where we are and where we're headed. And I think, for example, overly gauzy assumptions about when we're going to have a vaccine or when we're going to have an effective therapeutic, you know, it's nice to be hopeful. We all want to be hopeful, but I think that the reality of this is 
Uh, if you're going to begin an introduction of economic activity and you're going to continue to ramp that up, which I believe most reasonable analysts agree is the right thing to do, then what is the context under which you're going to do that? Um, we reject the notion that simply continuing along at a very slow speed is the right thing to do. I, I think the plan endeavors to, to help policymakers and those who are looking at this to understand how do we begin to open the spigot a little bit wider piece by piece, rather than simply accepting that we have to continue to bump along at a very low level of economic activity. So what are the conditions that you would uh, you'd want to create? What are the things that you want to see in order to, to bring about that higher level of activity? Yeah. I guess my, um, my concern about that, it, that the, the general um, thesis of it is lower uh, rates of death among younger folks, but if we allow it to get to spread, uh, and say New York City, say 20% of the population in New York City um, best estimates have been infected. If we allow New York City level, not all at once, but over time across the United States, 20% or 30% or 50% of the population to be infected, that is the, in cumulative, that is a huge impact. That would be, it would be the leading cause of death for 35 year olds. Um, if we have, if we allow 100 million people to become infected. And that is what this thing is so catchy that I'm, I'm concerned that unless we put aside some equally gauzy assumptions around, for example, our ability to have app, Bluetooth app-based contact tracing work, which was one of the features of the plan, which I think there's some real gauziness in terms of the assumption that that's going to be helpful or gauziness in terms of whether we can effectively segregate nursing home patients from the general population. I think there's some real optimistic assumptions that there isn't really uh, data for uh, around, around those assumptions. And then assumptions around our hospital's ability to handle surge if, if, it, if it happens. I, I guess I'm more from the epidemiologic point of view, um, I'm concerned that, that we can't kind of have our cake and eat it too. We can't assume that we're gonna have only 150,000 deaths um, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, say we can reopen um, and without having the, the preconditions and the gating net in terms of knowing only reopening when there isn't a ton of virus circulating in a community um, and that we have eyes on the thing. And I, I, you haven't said this, but Ovik has said, I'm proud that our plan doesn't have any gating criteria. We're not setting any preconditions before we open from a numeric point of view. So I guess that's my concern from an epi point of view. Mm -hmm. Mark, I don't, uh, we don't, we, I know you want to get onto other issues, but no. what I, what, what I would say is a few things. First of all, um, I, I, I think that the, th there is a sense out there that we, one of the arguments I continue to hear is, well, we, we need more information. We need more information and more information is always great. We, we always want to strive for more data and a better understanding of what's happening in the population. Um, but might I submit that there are a whole host of other issues that need to be addressed in the context of how do we get from where we are to where we want to go? And where we want to go is a place where people, again, are able to, for example, um, have a livelihood uh, and economic activity at the level it is right now is creating a whole host of other impacts, not just on the healthcare industry where the impacts have been significant, but beyond that as well. And so uh, what I'm proposing is simply to say that there, there are many different ways that one can get from the level of economic activity we see in many states to not even a level we were at before, but a level that more closely approximates where more people would be able to get out into the workforce and to get from point A to point B I do think a set of solutions like the one that we prescribe are a better approach than continuing to say, let's not do anything until we have perfect information or even near perfect information, which uh, you know I think my co-authors and I believe is simply not possible. As, as for contact tracing and, and some of the assumptions there, you know, I, I would agree that there are some optimistic assumptions built in regarding uh, you know, for example, the degree to which people would be willing to engage in contact tracing via technology. I think uh, we have to make some assumptions about how people are willing to respond. And by the way, the public opinion data suggests that a number of, of a high percentage of Americans would be willing 
to submit more data, for example, to government authorities to assist in identifying outbreaks, to assist in identifying who might be moving around. So I, I think who, who does this matters, the way in which it does it matters, but Americans have come together during this crisis in a lot of ways. And I would anticipate that some of that, that goodwill, at least with respect to controlling the virus going forward, would continue. Mm-hmm. And Lonnie, do you think that the key decision situation here is striking a balance between public health on the one hand and the economy on the other hand? And one of the questions we got from the audience was, uh, if, if that's the case, could we use cost-benefit analysis to figure out what's the right balance? Well, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I've heard the analysis that there's risk in everything we do, and I think that's certainly true. There is risk in everything we do. Uh, what we try to do is to minimize downside risk in any activity that we that we take on. You know, why do we put a seatbelt on when when we you know go out for a drive? Uh, why are pre-flight checks conducted before a plane takes off? These are all things and procedures we put in place to minimize and alleviate risk. So I I, um, I think any analysis of what policymakers want to do has to account for not only the first order public health concerns, which are clearly very significant and and should not be discounted, but should also account for what are other elements of the impact of those public health decisions. And no responsible policymaker should simply be looking in one bucket or the other and saying, all I'm going to care about are the economic measures, or all I'm going to care about, strictly speaking, are the public health measures. I think any responsible policymaker and the counsel I've given to policymakers around the country is, is precisely that, which is let's try and create a fair balance and let's try and determine the best way to minimize risk to the extent that we can while knowing we're never going to eliminate all risk, whether it's with respect to this virus or any other virus for that matter. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I may, Mark, the, the reason why so much of the economy shut down was not governors and mayors. If you look at the data, people started shutting down their activities. Restaurants had gone down to almost zero. Um, And unless we address people's fears and concerns, just announcing arbitrarily or or from a top-down way that we're gonna, you know, now now you're free to to go resume your lives as normal isn't gonna work. in my view, it's not so much of a trade-off to say we either control the outbreak or we have an economy. The best way to get our economy back in shape is to actually get control of this thing. And I, I guess I, I don't see there being this um, this this trade-off. I see us the, the being able to get control of this thing is how we get our economy back in shape. And I think it's possible. I. I think that we have shown that through this kind of cold water bath of physical distancing, we have reduced the reproductive number of this thing to less than one in most parts of the country. And I think we can turn the light dimmer switch and, and, and not have the, the scenario where 50, 60 percent of the population has to be infected. Okay, so your, your point is that demand is important here, too. If we reopen the economy and no one shows up, it doesn't help very much. There's certainly some plausibility to Lonnie's approach that, okay, well, we reopen the economy. Seniors may not want to go out, but 25-year-olds or 30-year-olds may be happy to go to those restaurants, and that, that certainly could work. Then there's the question of how able are we to separate those groups? A lot of people who are 25 or 30 live with someone who's in some kind of a higher risk category for whatever reason. And one of the questions from the audience is, uh, as you point out, Farza, this is going to be different in different cities. One city's got an outbreak, another one's fine. But Americans move around a lot. So how do we work with the, the, the reality that we are interconnected uh, usually, and but we have to be much less so as we reopen? Well, uh, Mark, let me, um, let me address a few elements of that. First of all, um, I personally, and, and I don't want to speak for my co-authors here, but I, I personally have advocated for a little bit more regional planning. So I think it's important that uh, particular states, for example, California, Nevada, Washington, and Oregon, um, ought to be considering some of what they're doing in concert with one another. I'm not saying that they all need the same policy or that even there ought to be the same policy within states. We're seeing this challenge in California very vividly where you've got 
uh, San Francisco Bay Area taking one approach. Even that approach has become fractured, frankly, over the last couple of weeks as various public health authorities have made decisions that are dissonant with one another. Um, I, I'm all for more coordination uh, between various authorities because most of the mobility we're seeing at this point in the crisis is mobility in a relatively constrained geographic area. We're not seeing the kind of mobility because air travel just isn't as common, right? You're seeing huge declines in air travel and rail travel. And so what, what we're not as concerned about at this stage of the crisis is sort of cross-country mobility, although such potential for mobility exists. The data suggests very strongly that the mobility we're seeing is regional mobility. So the degree to which we can have regional coordination, state-based coordination, even localities or metroplexes that are coordinating policy with one another, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we would encourage policymakers to do that. Um, when we do come back to a stage when people are comfortable traveling again, there is no question in my mind we're going to have to have policy interventions to address uh, travel. Ways of making air travel, to, to Farzad's point, people need to be comfortable getting on a plane. They need to be comfortable traveling. And that's going to involve the travel industry and the government working together to ensure that there are policies in place, whether it's temperature screening. We actually go a step farther and say that to, to fly, people probably ought to have a recent uh, negative RT-PCR test, or there ought to be testing capacity once it rises such that people can have comfort of getting a test or test results very close to the time when they're going to fly. So things like that, I think, are going to help build confidence. They're not measures that will be needed forever, but certainly as we get back online, those measures are important. But as for now, the, the, the amount of mobility we're seeing is actually pretty limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in terms of having a strategy that is informed by the realities on the ground, we have to be able to have different policies, absolutely, uh, for uh, one area where it's the, the virus is hot and the other area where the virus is cold, and we have to be able to distinguish between those two. And oftentimes that does mean sub-state level. Um, the White House wrote a letter to governors on March 26th telling them that they were going to send them county-level estimates of what's, you know, red, yellow, green. We're still waiting on those reports, those county level reports. I, I believe they exist. And I believe that the CDC has those maps and they're not, for whatever reason, uh, they're not releasing that information. I think if we want, I'm not asking for perfect information. I'm saying if federal public health officials have information about what's happening with emergency room visit rates or ILI visit rates, uh, at the county level, then we should be able to show those to people so they can make decisions for themselves about what their level of risk tolerance is and uh, understanding what um, what what's happening in in their communities. So mm -hmm. that to me, uh, if we're going to say there are, there are reopening crit gating criteria, which include the rate of emergency room visits for COVID like symptoms, then it is incumbent on us to also release that information at the state level at the county level, at the federal level, to the public. And we're not doing that right now. A lot of it's about the information. Well, let's talk about a slightly different type of information, serologic testing, which sees if someone actually has immunity to the disease, or at least has had the disease. We're certainly still learning about to what degree that confers immunity. Uh, and we have some tests that are not particularly accurate, but getting more so. So as they get more uh, available and accurate, what should be the role of serologic testing in reopening? And uh, particularly, there's a question about these digital immunity passports or digital immunity licenses. Lonnie, what role do you think those should play? Well, you know, we're, we're going to have to be guided by the science in some ways here because there is still a lot of variability around the effectiveness of these of these tests. And unfortunately, for a little while there, and probably arguably still, we've got a little bit of a Wild West mentality about some of this testing that's out there. So we, we, we don't necessarily have a great sense of uh, how much of this antibody testing is, is indeed accurate. And then beyond that, there have been uh, you know, methodological and other disputes about the existing studies that have been done around um, uh, around the level of or the percentage of people who have antibodies in a given area. There have been uh, studies done in L.A. County and Santa Clara County and other places, and, and you know, without getting into the disputes around those. Um, I, I think it would be a really significant development were we to be able to, to have uh, access to accurate data and if we had greater confidence around the protective nature of antibodies. Uh, I, I, think, I think it would be a real game changer in a lot of ways. 
there too, I think we're waiting on science and we're waiting on uh, kind of what happens in terms of being able to have better information about uh, about who actually has these uh, these protective antibodies and the degree to which this testing is accurate. Because at, at this point, at least, we are still flying a little bit in the dark on that question. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, Mark, I was a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer in New York City when West Nile virus hit. And we had a bunch of sick people, but we didn't know how widespread it was. And I was in charge of the team that went door to door in Queens in a grid on census block by census block in a, in a rigorous random sample of households to determine what the true infection rate was in the epicenter of that outbreak. It is astonishing to me, speaking of ser serology and serologic tests and immunity, that we still have these convenient samples, but we do not have a rigorous door-to-door -door sero survey at the community level in New Rochelle or New York City or anywhere else. It is astonishing to me that we don't have that information. That is the epidemiologic information you need that is at the community level to have a better handle on what the infection fatality rate of this thing is. That is very different than using it in individual cases to say to someone, oh, you're cool, you're, you know, you're immune. Because what we do know from basic math is that with a specificity of even 98.5% in a low prevalence area, 2%, 3% prevalence area, more than half of those tests are gonna be false positives. We're gonna give people a false assurance they're going to go into the nursing home falsely believing that they cannot be, that they're immune. And these tests, uh, until we get much, much higher specificity on those tests, uh, these are going to be, I think, uh, worse than useless, dangerous uh, in terms of people. And finally, in terms of the immunity passports, what percent infection are we thinking people are going to have? How many, what percent of the population is going to be able to go back to work? Uh, it depends on, are we saying 2% of the population? Or are we saying 20% of the population? And Again, I think we should all be very afraid of scenarios which are assuming 20, 30 percent infection rates in the general population. That would be catastrophic. Yeah. And we don't have evidence that that's we're anywhere near that at this point, too. We're getting a lot of questions, very tactical, uh, but very uh, understandable because most of us say, well, epidemiology is fine. I want to go to a restaurant. I want to go to the gym. So you think about restaurants. How can restaurants reopen? We know they'll be compromised in some ways, but Realistically, how can restaurants reopen safely for in-person dining? Well, I, I, I think you've seen some jurisdictions across the country try, try to implement various uh, techniques to ensure that that is safe. And that's going to mean more, more distance between tables, keeping some tables unoccupied, requiring reservations so there won't be walk-ins, um, so that you have a sense of what the flow is going to look like, ensuring that uh, servers are engaging in proper hygienic practices with respect to hand hygiene, but also hygiene in the preparation of food. Um, but, but, but some of this, you know, I, I think Farzad makes a very good point about the need for people to be psychically or psychologically comfortable going to a restaurant. People are not going to show up for dinner at a restaurant if they don't feel as though proper precautions have been taken by the restaurant, by the public health authority in that county to ensure that those practices are happening. So uh, I, I think it's gonna be a combination in terms of, of, you know, if people feel ready to go, I do think that there are steps that can be taken again to minimize or to lessen the risk of, uh, of acquiring the virus. But, you know, the, the other issue I'll just say is we've gotten some evidence that suggests that it's harder to transmit the virus in a way outdoors. So might there be more outdoor dining? You know, is that something that we would do, particularly as we move toward the summer months? That That's something that can be considered as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess also just so we don't get all of our hopes up, it seems to me that if I want to go out to a restaurant and I go out, I take my family, I'm living to go to a restaurant, I've got some risk of contracting the virus at the restaurant, from the restaurant. However, if what I really want to do is to go out and see all these friends I haven't seen in a while, and I get together at a table with six friends from different households, that's really elevating the level of risk much more. That's sort of the opposite of social distancing. Is that, is that correct? I mean, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, <laughs> go to that restaurant safely. Don't think about necessarily going with your friends. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. of course, it's, you know, if, if your whole family has been sheltering in place for the last, you know, 12 weeks and you go out with your family, you know, that's probably better if you're sitting three feet from your family member than if you're sitting three feet from someone who you have no idea where they, they could have been on an airplane an hour ago. You don't know. 
So I right, do wanna, I, mean, I, I do want to. obvious. Yeah. I do want to plus one what Lon he said about summer and outdoors. I think that is a that that would be huge, and and I think it gives us a lot more ability to reconnect and to work and and potentially. Um, you know, have things like schools in September reopening with outdoor instruction uh, to the extent possible. But I'm really worried about when that changes. I think we're going to, we've caught a break here in terms of the timing of it, that we, that the, the heat, the humidity, the people being outdoors. I do think that we are likely to be okay for the next few months and that cases will continue to kind of smolder along here, having a thousand deaths a day, 2,000 deaths a day, which seems crazy to say that, that go, oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, almost a 9-11 every day. I think we're going to smolder along for a while, but what I'm really worried about is what happens in November and December. Yeah. And yeah. Just, we really just, have to yeah. have our act together. We'll if there's a, a surge. I should mention, too, to your point uh, that I believe now at this point, almost every day, COVID-19 is a leading cause of death in America ahead of everything else. So, that's that's distressing. You know, one of the things we've mentioned a few times I want to dig into, and it seems to be the number one uh, weapon in our arsenal as we reopened it to prevent things from getting too bad is contact tracing. So everybody seems to agree, experts, that, you know, contact tracing on the one hand and the isolation of people we identify as infected is going to be critical to the success of reopening. Of course, it also these also have civil liberties indications. So, Lonnie, what does your plan think about how far should we go with contact tracing and isolation? Can the techniques work voluntarily? Will they or should they have mandates or penalties involved with them? And what's the best way to optimize all of that? Well, I mean, if you look at the sort of you know test, trace, and isolate regime in places like South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore, you know, it's been, it's been effective. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and certainly that's been an important part of what they've done in their public health response. Um, you know, in those societies, frequently the isolate part is, is uh, enforced with some kind of penalty, uh, civil, criminal, or otherwise, uh, to, to ensure that people are complying with the requirement. Now, it's an open question about whether we would want that or whether that would even be possible in the United States. So some, for example, have posited that cultural differences between uh, some of those Asian countries and what we see here in the United States would drive differing rates of compliance. Um, it seems to me to be a plausible argument. I don't think it's the entirety of the, of the argument or the entirety of the situation. Um, in, in my view, in select communities, so for example, um, I've thought a lot about higher education and in college, in the context of a college community, uh, I, I think there could be very effective uh, mandates put in place by an academic institution, for example, to say that if you travel, let's say you go to school in the fall and then you decide, hey, I want to go for a, a fall break trip to some place, that when you come back, you're going to be subject to quarantine. You're going to be subject to some testing and you're going to be subject to some kind of tracing institutions. I think are going to be able to do that. Private institutions, I think are going to be able to do that. Now the question becomes, when do you make the next jump to say then that local, let's say police authorities or local peace officers will be able to enforce that. I think that makes people a little bit less comfortable, but I think we're going to have to find the right balance here because it's not clear to me that voluntary compliance on its own in most cases is going to be sufficient. Uh, quite frankly, to achieve uh, the kind of control we want to achieve if and when we reach another hot spot uh, coming up. But I, I think in institutions, in smaller institutions, it is going to be easier uh, to pull this off than in large scale populations. Mm-hmm. Parson, think- how do you think contact tracing, how well can it work at scale in this situation? Well, let me let me first uh, uh, talk about the the proximity sensing Bluetooth app tech part of this before going to traditional public health uh, discussion. So I've been on the record as saying, I think it is uh, a little ridiculous. Uh, the number of assumptions people are making that these Bluetooth proximity things can accurately determine whether someone was really at risk or not. Um, forget about the all the work of integrate, how do you integrate that into public health and the police powers and the legal and the privacy concerns, but simply around adoption and the expectations that these things are gonna actually have public health utility to me seems absurd on multiple levels. If 50 million Americans downloaded that app 
then the chance of a case, an infected person having the app on their phone would be like rolling a six. And the chance that a contact of that person is detected by this Bluetooth app would be like rolling a double six. If everything works perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> and even in Iceland, whereas to my knowledge, they've had the highest rates uh, of adoption of this, they've got up to 40% of the, the population. That means 16% of contacts would in ideal circumstances be detected and the Icelandic authorities have said we don't think this thing is, is helpful at all. Singapore has said we don't think this thing has actually been helpful in control of the outbreak. It's been traditional contact tracing that's been effective and the report that we wrote with Gottlieb, McClellan, et al, we specifically said we're not talking about this Bluetooth with bangery, we're talking about basic core traditional public health contact tracing. Okay. Great. So can that work at the scale of the U.S. Uh, for this disease? Yes, if. We, we just did some modeling work with some um, Josh Solomon at Stanford and, and uh, Alyssa Belinsky at, at Harvard that we, um, where we found that you have to get 50% of the cases, symptomatic cases, diagnosed within days. Mm -hmm. 50%. You know, you know where we are now? We think we're at 10%, right? <laughs> So we have to do a fundamental quantum leap in terms of not just more tests. Everyone's talking about more tests, right? We need more tests. No, we need more diagnoses, right? It's not that you're dipping your pan in the water. You got to get the gold nuggets. Mm -hmm. And we're not, we're not near that now. And I think in order to get um, diagnosis of cases within like 24 to 48 hours of symptoms, we're going to have to really enlist primary care on the front lines of this thing. And, you know, the only problem we have is that we're, we're driving our primary care practices out of business uh, because they're not paid for um, phone calls and uh, they're, they're only paid for face-to-face -face visits up until recently. And literally they are going out of business. So, so Lonnie and I, I'm sure are on the same side of concern around the consolidation that might happen in, in the market uh, healthcare after this thing recedes, but in the short term, we lack the frontline capabilities in terms of COVID response in many communities, particularly rural communities. Yeah, I, and I would just say, Mark, on on just to go back to contact tracing for a minute. I mean, I I, I think traditional contact tracing is valuable and um, would be a a huge boon if we were able to scale. It, it is tremendously time, labor, and and uh, finance intensive. It, it's gonna mm -hmm. it's gonna require. Uh, significant amounts of money to hire people, to train them, to put in place the kinds of uh, regimes that will be necessary to conduct traditional contact tracing. So I, I, I'm all for more contact tracing. I do think the right answer is going to involve the fusion of traditional contact tra tracing techniques with technology. And so in that sense, I'm a little bit more optimistic that deploying some technology in addition to that is going to be a useful way for us to go, to go forward. Because I think large scale contact tracing statewide efforts, you know, while it sounds great, the reality is it's going to be very, very difficult to do in any reasonable amount of time. And certainly before a, a predicted fall winter wave hits again, um, I, I'm skeptical that we'll be able to stand up the kinds of contact tracing operations that would be necessary to be effective at scale across a broad number of uh, places in this country. I'm concerned. I'm concerned also. And I, I, I think one, we need the funding, not only for the contact tracers, but also to pay for people for income replacement. If you work with your hands and you're told to stay inside and isolate yourself for 14 days, that's not going to work. And we've proposed giving the equivalent of federal jury duty, 50 bucks a day for income replacement for those who need it. And also some, we're estimating about 14% of the population doesn't have the room uh, in multi-generational household to uh, isolate themselves. So providing hotel facilities for uh, for those folks. That's going to take money. Uh, and I agree with Lonnie that there's a lot that tech companies could do to help public health departments do contact tracing in a more effective and rapid way. It's just we're seeing all the attention to the, you know, the, the automated Bluetooth proximity sensing and very little attention to how do we actually help a public health worker do their job. Yeah, that feels like a magic bullet in many ways. Well, it's a, this integrated problem because, of course, if we first reopen, then we have to get people to go. And my guess would be that if people come out and start spending and going to restaurants and bowling alleys and everything else, 
And if they hear once in a while about somebody a couple towns over who got sick at a bowling alley, that's one thing. If they hear, you know, three in a week in their hometown, that's different. So it really is important that we're able to manage this if whether or not we're open, if anybody's going to show up. That's the challenge. Now, there's a lot of questions about herd immunity uh, in general. And Sweden is one co country that is pursuing that. So far, let me start with you. What do you think about the possibility of creating herd immunity in the U.S.? Typically, the formula is, you know, one minus one over R <laughs> is the percent of the population you need to get herd immunity. So if R is 2.5, that means you have to get 65 percent of the population infected. Uh, so is that what we're, you know, is that what we're signing up for? Um, I, I think there's some, you know, hopeful thinking that maybe if there's different compartments and you got a bunch of people who are really, really at high risk of getting and giving and you get them infected sooner. So maybe, maybe we can have those, thank those people in the bars, uh, to, who would get themselves infected more quickly, uh, and, and take themselves out of this. But I think, uh, I think herd immunity is is a um, unless the infection fatality rates are are a lot lower than than what we think, and the New York City experience does not bear that out. I think we're not we should not be looking to herd immunity to to bail us out of here without a catastrophic uh, number of of deaths. Um, yeah, and Lonnie, before you respond, just real quick, when I do back of the envelope calculations of stuff, and these are all big assumptions. 65% of the population is what, 220 million Americans or something like that. And if the fatality rate is 1% or 2% or half, whatever, we're talking about uh, a low millions of Americans dying from this, which is more than all the wars combined we've had in America going back to the Revolutionary War. So it's a very big number of deaths. Maybe we can uh, slant that if we really protect the most vulnerable. So maybe it's only half that, maybe it's only a million, but only a million is a huge number of deaths for us. So um, that's a challenge. And what do you think about Sweden before you leave that? Because that's often brought up. Sweden did was not able to protect the nursing home patients. Like the whole the whole premise of this idea is that you you kind of let the younger people go out and have their lives and get infected, and you protect the older people. But same as same as here, forty to fifty percent of the deaths in Sweden from nursing home patients. So to me, Sweden. And you know, compared to Denmark and Finland and, and uh, Norway, they're not doing well, relatively speaking. So I don't know. And we haven't seen any, again, rigorous seroprevalence studies to indicate that they are close to achieving herd immunity. I, I kind of doubt it. Um, there was a recent uh, um, PCR survey where they found less than 1% of the population that they tested were positive. So I'm I'm very concerned about uh, you know, crowning Sweden a, a success story until we've seen any evidence that they've either been able to isolate nursing home patients or to have anything approaching herd immunity. Yeah, yeah I, you look, I, I think the evidence is fairly clear, Mark, whether it's from Sweden or from here in the United States, that we need to give serious consideration to how we protect those in skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, uh, people who are who are clearly age vulnerable to COVID-19. I mean, there, there's just no question that policy has been behind the curve on this one. And going forward, we are going to have to be pretty aggressive in thinking about protections for that population. It might involve very regular testing of workers, uh, ensuring that you don't have workers moving from one nursing home to another. Some chains have that uh, problem where you've got the same set of workers migrating between nursing homes. I don't think we can have that visitation is going to have to be severely curtailed. And, and the flip side of that is, you know, we're creating a scenario where uh, people are getting sick and dying in, in isolation if they're older. And that, that's the flip side of this, which is, yes, we want to isolate that population. Yes, we want to do the best we can to protect them, but it's creating a very sad set of circumstances. So we have to be a lot smarter about policy interventions that are targeted toward that group in particular. But the answer cannot be a, a, a blanket set of proposals to say, you know, no one can see them. And, you know, that's that. So we, we've got to figure out a better way out of this one, because um, it is a problem in all of the countries that we've looked at here in the United States, a staggering percentage of COVID-19 deaths are attributable to deaths in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities. Over 80% in Minnesota, 61% in North Carolina. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's been a travesty uh, what's happened there, over 60% of the deaths. 
have been in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So we've got to do better with this population. We've got to, to give a little bit more thought to what the right answer there is. And clearly herd immunity is not going to be the right answer for that population. Right. The question is uh, where, where it sits for the rest of us, because I know that the question is, what about the people who are not in nursing homes who are also at some risk, either because of age, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, which is a reasonably high percentage of the U.S. adult population, much more than most people realize. Um, so Just to follow up on that, Mark, half the people in New York City who were hospitalized were under the age of 65. So even though the mortality rate is skewed and only 25% only, 25% of the deaths are under 65, fully half of the hospitalizations were under 65. Mm-hmm. So it is, there is a large population of vulnerable folks, uh, even in the younger age groups. Yeah. Now, Lonnie, I know you talked about your plan calling for the opening up of schools very soon for all kinds of reasons. And again, kids have very low rates of death, at least from COVID. What the challenge is that there's a fair number of teachers and administrators in those schools who are at risk. And maybe that's a third, maybe that's a quarter, maybe that's half, some number. How can schools really reopen uh, and keeping the the, the non-kids there safe? Right. Well, it, it, you know, I think the evidence that we've seen suggests about a quarter of the academic staff, so that would be teachers and administrators, would be vulnerable in some way. Look, there, there's going to ha- there's no question that this is not going to happen all at once. I think some uh, of my colleagues have suggested, not my co-authors, but but colleagues in other settings have suggested, well, you know, let, let let's just open the schools up without conditions in the in the fall. I, I don't see that as the right approach. I don't I don't take that approach. I think we've got to be a little bit more targeted in terms of how we think of it because the challenge I do not see the challenge fundamentally as being the the kids. I think the kids themselves, all of the evidence we have and certainly the US data suggests that um, COVID-19 fortunately has has resulted in far less mortality for school age children than uh, than even uh, influenza or other respiratory diseases for that age group. Now, the question does go then to, um, to to those populations, the older teachers, for example, older administrators. And I think that's why we're going to have to look at tiered returns to school, some kids coming back in uh, at, uh, on some days because there's going to be reduced faculty capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have distance learning. So perhaps it's the case that vulnerable faculty members predominantly focus on distance learning whereas those who are younger who do not have those comorbidities are able to instruct in person. You cohort students. You think about ways of doing more outdoor instruction. Um, But the in-person educational experience is so important to educational progress. I cannot emphasize that enough, that we, we are doing a serious disservice to children and particularly children from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds, we're doing a significant disservice by keeping everything shut down. Von, he has a do great, not have access. Yeah. Von, he, you had a great piece about colleges. And, and I thought that was a that was a really great point. And what colleges give you that K to 12 doesn't give you is the ability to actually isolate them into their own insular communities. The problem with the K to 12 is those kids go home. Uh, and we know now know that even though they don't get sick, they get infected just as much. And we don't know, but they're probably infectious as well as infected. So kids can serve as an efficient spread vector, probably. But yep. college age students lock the doors. <laughs> you know, yeah. like keep them. You can. You can do a lot, as as Lon he points out in his article, to to not kind of steal that 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 college educational opportunity from. Yeah. These students. Well, going back far as so going back to K through 12, you know, there was an article, just a study published just this week in Health Affairs, a very respected journal, looking at various social distancing measures over the past couple of months and their impact. And they found social distancing did work by and large, had a big impact uh, in terms of the lowering infection rates, uh, but particularly from closing restaurants, bars, and gyms. But it was they didn't, at home. I'm sorry? The, the biggest impact was shelter at home. Um, yeah, overall, but they specifically didn't find that relationship for closing schools. So does that make you feel any better about Lonnie's plan? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's one study and it's <laughs> it's all ecological. Um, I wish we had more uh, epi data about, mm-hmm. um, you know, kids as vectors. Uh, but, you know, that one that one study did make me feel a little bit better, to be honest. Um, uh, it's but I guess what I would say is that. This, you know, this school year is, is, was gone. Um, September, we're going to have to just watch it. And I, I think what I worry about is we don't really have eyes on this thing. Mm-hmm. If the time, if we're going to wait for deaths to go up, it's three to four weeks after the thing starts to go exponential. And if it's doubling every three days, that's a hundred X 
<laughs> bought yourself a 100x increase in the infected population if you're waiting for deaths to be your signal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, we've got to prioritize between now and September having sentinel surveillance, having syndromic surveillance, having um, ambulatory care providers serving as testing sites. Like we have like three months to get it, get in gear. And what worries me is three months ago, you know, Zeke and I wrote an article talking about how we need, we need the surveillance systems. And as far as I can tell, we were no closer than we were then. So what, what the heck is going on in terms of us actually focusing on the early surveillance aspects of this? So we don't let the, 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 the building get on fire before we realize something's wrong. Right. Well, just so to push further on that, so you and Zeke, Ezekiel Emanuel, wrote a piece saying we need to be doing 750,000 tests a week. And now we're up to 300,000 a day. So we're three times that level. Is it that we're not, is it we're doing enough, but not in the right place or not the right way? Yeah. What we actually said is it's not the number of tests, it's the design. It's just like, you know, you can give the drug to a lot of people, but unless you have a randomized clinical trial, you don't know if it's working or not. It's the same thing. It's who you're doing the testing on. Is there a systematic, group of people that you're testing consistently so you can follow their positivity rates over time? Do you get information about their onset, symptom onset date so you can create a proper epi curve? Do you have information about hospitalizations on your ER um, uh, syndromic surveillance program? So it's, a, it's in stat news, folks can look it up, but it's uh, that we are not doing smart testing. We're just doing more testing. And we're not getting coordination at the national level on that. Are any states or localities doing the kind of testing you're talking about, the smart testing? I think North Carolina is, is making some good efforts, and I think California with Bob, my friend Bob, uh, yeah. and Paul Markovich leading the way are, are thinking about it the smart way. But the I don't know where they're yet. Co-chairs of Governor Newsom's testing council, I know, overall. Lonnie, you know, it seems to me that whether it's your plan or the White House plan or the other plans, they, there, there are some specifics in all those plans. And it seems that many states are reopening or have reopened ahead of those plans, right? Uh, which is a cause for concern. As far as I point out, it'll take a few weeks to know if that was a mistake or not. But are you seeing any place that you feel are being really responsible and opening uh, conservatively according to the plans? Well, I, I mean, a number of jurisdictions are proceeding conservatively. I think, I think that's certainly the case. I mean, it, it, we'll we'll have to see. Uh, the early evidence from Georgia and Florida, uh, you know, ha has not indicated a, a spike. It's a little early to tell, frankly. Uh, I think we're going to need some more data there. But I think that you know, we should all have reason for hope when we see that. What I would say, what has bothered me less than the the pace is some of the inconsistency that we've seen within states. Um, and some of that will certainly need to be tailored to local conditions. But what I'm bothered by is the lack of mooring, it seems to me, to a plan as to how this is gonna go forward. And I think that has resulted in some changes in jurisdictions, some abrupt changes in terms of decisions that have been made. I would just submit to you, for example, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, there's been a little bit of a challenge around there not being a sync up between San Francisco and then San Mateo and Santa Clara counties where San Francisco and San Mateo uh, decided to, to move ahead a little bit more quickly than Santa Clara does. And Santa Clara has now you know, played a little bit of catch up there. Those kinds of situations, again, to get back to the coordination point, I, I really do think we need to be thinking regionally about this because of the, the mobility issue we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a problem when areas are not syncing up and coordinating. And then you had L.A. County saying at one point they were going to you know, continue um, you know, lockdown effectively through August, which I, I just don't think was going to be tenable. So I, I, I think we need to see a little better coordination, a little more communication between areas. Um, but overall, I think a number of jurisdictions have, have proceeded pretty, um, pretty well. Okay. One more question for you about just about employers. And I'm talking about both the very large employers that are almost like nation states and the corner drugstore, you know, the, the, the employers have a handful of employees. What should we expect from employers ha as we reopen? Do they need additional liability protection? And uh, one question for the audience is, is how, how do we know that employees will trust their employers to keep them safe when they come back? Seems to be a big part of the reopening argument. Yeah, well, em em employers are gonna have to communicate to their employees exactly what the reopening plan is. I mean, some employers 
um, McDonald's and, and, and others, uh, hospitality companies have put together very comprehensive plans. Even apparently Major League Baseball's put one together to, to maybe bring baseball back. Uh, th those kinds of communications around health and safety plans are going to be very, very important. And employers, many of whom I've talked to, are, are working on those and thinking actively about that. Um, I, I do think the liability issue I is an issue. Uh, and I think Congress is going to have to think carefully about what kind of safe harbors or liability protections might need to be put in place to uh, to ensure that returns to workplace are 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 able to happen in a safe and responsible way. Um, I think the federal government is going to have to step in with uh, with some assistance in terms of if we're expecting employers, for example, to test at their workplaces, we've got to figure out a way to facilitate the provision of those tests and the processing of those tests. Uh, and, and, you know, that's all going to take time, resource and money. So there are a number of different policy interventions that have to happen. But ultimately, and at the end of the day, employers are going to have to play a big role in this. Mm -hmm. Mark, if I if I may jump yeah. in, there's been there was I think Peggy Noonan had a had an article about how, you know, like this is it's elitist to to be concerned and about uh, the the public health issues. Um, and that you know, people who are lower income are more worried about uh, about getting back to work. And I guess I, I would say, first of all, I, I've been following the Harris Poll surveys. That does not seem to be born, regardless of her her close contact with the working class. That doesn't seem to be borne out by surveys, where those who are lowest income are, in fact, more worried about about catching. Uh, COVID and about facing the consequences of that. And you can understand why, because they are on, they are more exposed and they are in the service industry oftentimes where they don't have a choice as to, uh, to be exposed or not. And, and one of the things that, uh, as we're talking about businesses reopening that I'm very worried about is actually people being put in harm's way without a choice, being told, you know, you know, you can no longer <laughs> collect unemployment, you have to go back to work at that meat packing plant and know we're not going to make it safe for you. So I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, common under common perception that, oh, you know, this is, this, this is, uh, that, that working class people really want it, want an end to these, uh, to these restrictions and they want to get back in there. And I think that may be true in some cases, but there's also the counter of many of them don't want to have to go back without being actually protected and without feeling safe, and and I worry about that coercive aspects of that as well. And I'm sure many work, many of those people work for the same employer, so there's going to be some real challenges there overall. Well, we're just about out of time. I've got time for one last question for a quickie. You each get 30 seconds to answer it. I'll give you the same question. Simple one. What's the one recommendation you would make to the federal government right now about how to how to address the pandemic? And Lonnie, we'll start with you. Um, you know, I think the federal government uh, needs to really step up in terms of of providing some of this um, uh, incentive around coordination that I spoke about earlier. Uh, I, I do think that it's going to be tough for states, some states, to get their acts together in terms of coordinating around them. And so, having that little boost from the federal government to say, "Look, we can help you coordinate your activities and think through what you're hap what, what you're doing and what's happening," I think is absolutely essential. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's going to be tough for us to walk our way out of this alone, uh, whether you're talking about a city or a county, and, and ultimately having a, a broader sort of set of equities and considerations will be important. Right. I agree with you. I, I think you cannot have the federal government abdicate its role, its leadership, guidance, information, funding uh, in this outbreak. And, and uh, we have seen, unfortunately, I think too little of uh, CDC on the epi front and the surveillance side. There was an article today about how there's their their line level and and leadership there are, are feeling hampered in their ability to to do what what CDC does best. And I also think there's been a sense of stepping back from being accountable for um, coordination and and information sharing. Uh, so I I. You know, it is, uh, it's ironic that uh, I, I spent 10 years at the New York City Health Department arguing for uh, the, the balance of power between state and local and federal, and I was a federal health official, and now seeing the lack of an effective federal response is making a lot of people say, no, we need a stronger federal hand uh, in, in pandemic response. I would 
guess I would say sustained mandatory funding of state and local health departments should also be maybe something that we consider a federal role for. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for those answers. And before we close, I want to remind uh, all the audience to visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to stay informed about other programs, both COVID and non-COVID related in our series in association with the Zetima Project. So I want to give a big thanks to Lani Chen and Farzad Mastashari for joining us today for today's virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club. Thanks also to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the collaborative local donors who have supported this program financially. I encourage you to do the same, particularly if you enjoyed this program. Please make a donation yourself. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you all.